It's my enormous privilege to introduce Bridget Strawbridge Howard, who is the best among us in that as a grown up, she has discovered the joy of wildlife and the joy of being in the wild and in particular hurled herself at her love of bees. And in some ways, bees have saved Bridget and Bridget has become um, spearhead of a campaign for bees and the habitats that they need and the flowers that they need um, and so and if you haven't read her wonderful book Dancing with Bees you must at this straight as soon as this ends trot off to Wild Sounds and Books and buy a copy of Dancing with Bees which will be a brilliant follow-up but with that I'm going to hand over to you Bridget good morning to you down in Devon a very very warm morning to you and talk to us about bees please. Yay thank you thank you for that lovely introduction Nick um, so I'm going to talk about bees. Um, the most difficult thing is always working out what to leave out, but I have a slideshow presentation. So I'm going to try, we tested this earlier and it worked, share screen. Um, great. So I hope now that everybody can see a bee. Um, and this, this same bee I've been using to open my presentation for around 10 years now. Um, this is a beautiful male. Um, a little male um, Andrina bee who I just just yeah, just met him a few years sort of before before I started doing these shows these these slideshows and I love him so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, pollinators in general and then move on to to bees um, I start I haven't got many wordy slides but this is one of them just to put this into context so, so globally, there, there are some 352,000 flowering plants. They are pollinated, those that are not um, sort of wind pollinated of, of our plants, are pollinated by around 300,000 different species of pollinating animal, which is staggering. Um, and of those, around 20,000 are bees. And these are just, um, you know, flowering plants, pollinators, bees, those that have been um, described, there will be many, many more. And by pollinators, so in other areas of the, of the world, you know, in the tropics, uh, creatures like bats and birds um, are, are very major pollinators. But, but in um, Britain and Ireland, and in fact in Europe, um, it's the insects that, that are our pollinators. And before I move on to, to bees, I just want to give a nod to some of the other very important groups. Um, so beetles, this, this beautiful thick-legged beetle here. Beetles um, were, were amongst the, they were the first pollinators actually, sort of way back in the Cretaceous times. Um, wasps, very, very important pollinators as well as um, really useful garden predators. Uh, butterflies and moths also important and flies, specifically, particularly hoverflies um, are a very um, uh, overlooked group. So, so flies, flies, um, often will will visit areas that bees um, don't want to go in you know, woodland edges dark damp areas you often get flies so very very important um, and the importance of pollinators of course cannot be overstated um, they are responsible to some extent or the other uh, for for pollinating a, a, our global food crops so around 75 percent of them and you know at the very least they they help to increase the yield and the quality of those crops in some cases there are some crops that that um, rely almost 100 percent on insect pollination um, like apples for instance and, and there are other crops that rely 100 percent um, percent on bumblebees, um, bumblebees that I'll come to later, that are able to do things that other bees cannot do. So, so that's that's all very human centric, um, and it's because of their their value to the global food crops that bees, um, insect pollinators, and their decline is being taken so seriously. But um, yeah, it's far more important um, to to me is is their intrinsic value. Uh, and their value when it comes to pollinating the world's plants, the world's um, wild um, plants and, and other flowering plants. And around 87% of the world's flowering plants are pollinated by insect pollinators. They underpin most of our terrestrial ecosystems and without them, many of these systems would collapse. They're indicator species and an indicator species is something that, that indicates to us the health of, of a certain ecosystem or environment. And um, bees are clearly telling us that all is not well. 
And they're also very important, these insects, uh, they're right at the bottom of the food chain. So, so you know, insect decline is, is obviously impacting on other declines, the declines in farmland birds and um, amphibians, you know, it, they, they're right at the bottom and terribly important for that reason. So I, I'm going to mention pollinators, you know, other pollinators every now and then, but, but the, 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 this talk really is about bees, uh, about their, their behavior, their um, life cycles, their um, relationships with flowering plants. And, and, and I hope that, that by the end of the talk, if you are not already a little in love with, with bees, that, that you might be by the end of the talk, or at least more interested uh, or more in awe of, of some of the, the, the crazy and incredible things that they're capable of doing. Um, so when I say bee, like bee bees, I, I tell people when people ask, what do you do? I say, I talk about bees. Um, I actually think a lot about bees as well. Um, and people immediately, I say the word bee, and this is what comes to mind. Um, they usually say, oh, I know a beekeeper. So people, when they hear bee, they're thinking honey, beekeepers, honeycomb, beehives, probably stings as well. But if I were to give those same people, all of you, a piece of paper and some coloured pencils and ask you to just quickly draw me a bee, you probably draw me something more like this. So this is more bumblebee-esque. And it's clearly we, we, we're not 100% sure about, about what a bee is. And it gets more complicated because there are creatures um, that look very, very much like bees that are not bees. So I want to just, just show you, talk to you about these before I um, come on to bees. So this is clearly not a bee. This is a fly, um, one of our many, many species of fly. Um, you wouldn't mistake that for a bee. You probably wouldn't mistake this insect for a bee either. This is one of our the Britain and Islands, um, thousands and thousands, we have solitary wasps, and this is one of them. What about this one? This is not so um, cut and dry, is it? So, so to the untrained eye, this might look like a bee. You might think um, this is a bee, it, it moves, it, um, it flies, it acts, it behaves like a bee, but it is in fact a hoverfly. Uh, it's a drone fly, and it is essentially pretending to be a bee. This is this is called Batesian mimicry and and it's an amazing thing. So so if if um, a hoverfly looks and sounds like a bee, it's more likely or less likely to be predated by a bird on the wing. Um, so the birds on the wing, if they see an insect that's a bee, they, they might just be put off by by the idea of, of, of the sting. So so this is a very, very good strategy to avoid predation. And you can see if I show you picture of the honeybee. I've actually got a slide of the two together here, how very, very similar they are. Um, so, so that's, that's one, um, one insect that adopts this, um, this mimicry strategy. And what about this one? Um, this also is not a bee. This is not a bumblebee. Uh, this, this is incredible. This is, this is species specific mimicry. So this, this uh, hoverfly, this bee mimic um, here, is imitating the white-tailed bumblebee, a bumblebee that has a white tail. Um, and then this one is mimicking the red-tailed bumblebee, Bombus lapidarius. And there is a way that you can tell it, it's, I mean, I, I can't tell it, they just whiz past me, but if one stops still long enough for you to look at it, the, the, the obvious differences are the eyes. Um, so all of the flies have great big fly eyes that almost join in the middle, whereas bees eyes are sort of more oval and more on the sides of their heads. The second thing is the antennae. If you see here, the, the flies have short, stubby, sort of hairy antennae, whereas bees are long and hairless and more, more elegant. Um, you can't see this from above, but, but flies are more stumpy. They don't have the waspish waists that bees have. And if you are able to, to, to look really closely, uh, you would see that flies have one set of wings, whereas bees have two. And there are other mimics as well. The, the, um, one of the first you'll see this this year now, isn't it? This year is, is the bee fly. So, so in, in March, in early spring, these little fuzzy, furry, bumblebee-esque creatures will start flying. You'll see them low down on the ground and um, that they, they are flies. Um, that they're actually quite cheeky because what they do is the reason you see them so low down on, on the ground and 
in amongst sort of um, sparse, sparsely vegetated lawns and things like that and, and edges is, and you might see them sort of wiggling their bottoms in the dirt. And what they're doing is they're, they're sort of, uh, they lay their eggs or they, they kind of deposit, they squirt their eggs into the, the nests of ground nesting solitary bees, the Andrina species. Um, and when they're wiggling their, um, their rear ends in the, in, in the dirt, the dust, they're sort of trying to, to gather some of the dust to give weight to their eggs. So, so anyway, that's, that's a bee fly. And this one is a dotted bee fly, uh, which is, is not as common as many of the others. Um, and then there are also, it's not just bee mimics, there are wasp mimics. This is a, a marmalade hoverfly, very, very beautiful creature. So it's not surprising um, that, that people get confused about um, what is and what is not a bee. And I mean, if I had a penny for every single story I have seen um, just in the last year um, in, in the media about bumblebees with a, a photograph of a honeybee or the other way around, or um, uh, just a bee with a photograph of a fly. You know, I, I'd, I'd at very least have, a, have enough for a couple of cups of coffee. Uh, one of the worst examples ever is this. And this is a very important book, Bees of the World by Christopher O'Toole and Anthony Raw with a photograph of a fly on the front cover. So the authors were dismayed, obviously, when they saw this. I think it was a library edition. Um, it's the edition I have as well. So yeah, it gets, gets quite bad. So bees, bees. Um, as I've said, worldwide, there are around 20,000 different species of bee. Um, in Britain and Ireland, um, we have about about 280 roughly, only one of them is a honeybee. So there's one species of honeybee, 24 species of bumblebee, depends on whether you count recent reintroduced, recent extinct, um, recent arrivals. Um, and the rest, um, around 250 are solitary bees. And of the bees, of the bumblebees and the solitary bees, around 70 of them are what's known as cuckoo bees um, and without going into it in in any detail these are bees that lay their eggs in the nests of other bees so what I wanted to do something I think that's absolutely fundamental if, if you want to uh, cr create habitats and um, for, for bees and gardens or, or encourage bees onto your land I, I think it's best to start with the knowledge of the bees themselves you know then the rest will follow so one of the things still still following on from the confusion about um, what is and is not a bee um, is, is the difference between social and solitary bees. So the honeybees and the bumblebees are both social species and by social, so social insects um, or, or you social, a truly social um, insect um, always has an overlap of generations in its colony. So they live in colonies. Um, and by an overlap of generations, I mean that they, they will have um, adults from different generations. Um, so so the, when the young um, hatch out, they don't leave the colony, they stay. There is a division of labor, a reproductive division of labor. So there is a just one queen, um, a queen bee or queen ant or queen termite, um, who does all of the laying lays, all of the eggs, and then there are many, many uh, hundreds or thousands of um, female workers. Um, and it's, it's the workers, the workers, again, within certain um, colonies, certain social insect colonies, uh, that there are even caste systems, you know, it, it may be that, that certain, so with bumblebees, for instance, the, the, the largest bumblebees tend to be the ones that do the foraging because they can bring back the most pollen and nectar. And then the smaller ones will probably stay more in the nest and, and do the, the, the cleaning and, and the feeding and, and maybe the guarding. And then the, the third um, thing that defines a, a colony of social, truly social bees is cooperative care of the young. So, so all of these, um, these workers, all of these sister workers help, um, they cooperate with, when caring for the young and feeding the young. Um, so of these, um, the, the social bees um, that, that we have in Britain and Ireland, the, the one of course that is the most well-known is the honeybee. And honeybees, oh, as well as being, honeybees are important just, just for 
um, obviously their intrinsic value in everything that the individual honeybee does within a hive or within a colony. It does for the greater good of the whole, which is, this is often sort of thought of as, I, I like to think of it as the spirit of the hive. Um, they're, they're known as super organisms, the colony collectively known as a super, super organism, um, you know, because they can't manage with any one part. They can't manage without the queen, without the workers, without the males. Um, and they are important um, from a human centric point of view because they can be managed and because they can be managed, they can be transported to where the crops are. So, so they have become, in fact, we have come to rely on them um, too much. Um, and, and there are areas where, uh, because honeybees have been able to be shipped in uh, in their billions, that, that local populations of wild native bees have been completely wiped, wiped out. So there's no plan B whilst we rely exclusively on the honeybee. Um, but, but beautiful in their own right as well. So the, I just wanted to say a little bit about the, um, the nesting um, habitat requirements of each of these types of bees. So, but not as much about the honeybee. Um, but, but honeybees, uh, obviously they live in hives. Um, we think of them as living in hives where they're managed and kept. But if they were in the wild, they would probably choose um, and have in the past chosen hollow trees um, and, and under roofs and things as well. But, but th this is a log hive. Um, and, and I just want to show you this. This is a swarm of honeybees arriving to take up residence in a hive, which is a hollowed out log. And you can see here, they're all piling into these, these holes. Um, so, so that's, they came of their own accord because that's what they would do in the wild. So no more about honeybees now. Um, I may refer to them later on, but I'm not gonna go into any more detail. Um, I want to move on to the, our native wild bees now. And so the other social bees um, are the bumblebees. Uh, and, and these are just four photographs that I've chosen just to give you an idea of the diversity. So out of our 25 odd bumblebee species, around eight of them, um, are common and, and those eight are common and doing quite well because they're generalists they're not fussy um, eaters it, it's the, uh, the it's the bumblebees that are sort of more choosy about um, about the plants they forage on that are in steepest decline and these bees top left here this is this is the buff-tailed bumblebee Bombus terrestris um, and this is the bee that you're probably most likely to see as the weather improves. In fact, we have a nest in our back garden at the moment that unusually um, this species uh, tends to continue nesting over winter um, with the warmer weather. It's another whole story. Um, but yeah, look out for these, these bees prospecting for nests um, in the next few months. Top right is Bombus lapidarius, the red-tailed bumblebee. And th this is the bee that that hoverfly I showed you earlier on was mimicking. They're very, very beautiful, very distinct, very easy to identify. Often find them on, on plants like chives and, and dandelions. Um, oh, bottom right. Um, oh, this is the great yellow bumblebee, Bombus distinguendus. I assume that means distinguished, I don't know, um, but it, it ought to, if it doesn't, it ought to. And this bee is one of, this is an iconic bumblebee, and, and this bumblebee has been squeezed uh, because of changes to, to our landscape, because of intensive ag agriculture, squeezed up to the, the, the north, most north western areas of, of, of Scotland and um, the Western Isles and the West Coast of Ireland. And uh, it, it really is a magnificent and very, very beautiful bee. And it has nowhere else to go now. Um, so, so that's the great yellow bumblebee. You won't find that in your garden um, south of, unless, you live, unless you're lucky enough to live in the Outer Hebrides or Northwest Scotland. And then one last bumblebee I wanted to show you. This is beautiful. This is um, a male white-tailed bumblebee. And I know he's a male because he has facial hair. He has a moustache. Um, so male bumblebees do have moustaches. Um, this is sort of a, a, a yellowish color. Some of them are creamy and some of them are quite white. So, so, so yeah, great diversity. And I'm gonna talk more about uh, the bumblebees um, uh, talents as, and, and importance as pollinators later on.
So habitat for bumblebees, um, many different types of, of habitats. They, the, some of our, our carda species, they like these tussocky grass sort of areas where they, they, they'll nest in um, abandoned um, field voles nests and they card little bits of moss together and, and they nest quite close to the surface. This is a compost bin, you can't see, I never did catch um, a photograph of the bees coming in and out, but there were um, buff-tail bumblebees nesting inside the compost um, here. Old stone wall, we had a, a again, a buff-tail bumblebee nest inside this old stone wall. And this, if you can see here, this is an abandoned rodent's nest. Um, this is kind of, you know, first choice for, for most bumblebees. Uh, it, they will look for um, a, a nest of a, a, an abandoned rodent's nest because it always has nesting material already in it. Um, so there's, there's not much work to do. And then the other thing that there is one bumblebee that we have um, that's just kind of a recent arrival, recent-ish in the last 10, 12 years, the tree bumblebee. Bombus hypnorum that, that has arrived naturally uh, from, from Northern Europe. And it, it is um, famous for nesting in bird boxes. It's, it's a bit of an opportunist, but I, I haven't got any photographs of them in bird boxes, but I did um, watch a colony a few years back nesting inside this old cannon uh, in a, a garden where my husband works. And the previous year there had been great tits nesting. So again, they use, use an area where there's a previous nest and also, um, for a whole summer, I watched it. This is a, a, a muck spreader and the, the farm across the road from where we, we lived. He took this, the farmer took this muck spreader out, spread the muck three times a week and always took with it. You see in here, the tree bumblebees. Um, and bless me, he, so, so they were on the move a lot and uh, very confused. And he did get stung once or twice, but he was wonderful and he just let them be. So I just want also just to, to very briefly cover the life cycle of the bumblebee because if again if you're aware of these things and you're aware of um what's around when and what its needs are you're more likely to be able to provide uh so so this is the, the first stage this is a queen um bumblebee and she's just coming out of hibernation and and this is going to happen sort of february march um she's starving she's been there since last end of last summer autumn so the first thing she needs to do is stock up um, on, on nectar and pollen, which is where these pussy willows uh, and any other early flowering plants, especially um, flowering shrubs or trees, terribly important. Once she's stocked up, she will prospect for and find a nesting site and she will begin, she, she'll collect pollen. She lays her first batches of eggs um, into the, to the pollen. Um, and when they hatch out, so about um, two weeks later and then two weeks after that, so, so basically about four weeks from um, laying the egg until they um, they are flying as, as adult bumblebees, adult female worker bumblebees. So, so they will leave the nest, um, come backwards and forwards to the nest and, and do all the foraging from there on in. And the queen will keep laying more and more batches of eggs. So the, the nest will grow, grow, grow to on a good year with a, a species that, that produces a lot of, of bumblebees up to about 400 bumblebees in a nest. Um, and then at the height of the cycle of um, the nest, the, the queen bumblebee will, will lay male eggs and daughter queens. Um, and the males and the daughter queens will leave. They will mate with um, uh, bumblebees from other nests. And then the queen then uh, will go almost immediately. She stocks up, um, fills up with, with nectar and pollen, and then she, she digs a hole in a north facing, south, north facing bank and goes into hibernation. And the other bees die off. So, so the, the old queen um, is worn out and dies. The workers all die. The, the males um, uh, die too. So, so the future of this species is invested in this, this hibernating queen, this fertilized hibernating queen um, until she comes out and the whole cycle starts again next year. So those are the social um, bees. The, the others, the bulk, the majority of the bees on this planet are solitary. I say solitary um, I, I, very loosely to, to some degree or, or another. There are varying degrees of sociality within the, this, this group of so-called solitary bees, but, but a true solitary bee um, is basically a single 
um, it's a single mother, the, the, the females are single mothers. There are no overlapping generations as there are um, in the, the social um, bee colonies, no caste system. There are no queens um, or workers. There, is just, there are just females and males and um, they have no social traits whatsoever. Um, and again, just to give you an idea of the diversity of these solitary bees, the, these are just a few of the bees I've photographed over the years um, in our gardens. Um, so these are all fairly common, I, I won't name them, but, but I just want you to have a look at, at the difference in form and color and shape so, you know, some of them said this is a this is a male lazy glossum, very long and slender. And then this is a um, tawny mining bee, beautiful, um, sort of round and very, very furry like a bumblebee. Uh, then you've got this bee down here. This is one of the cuckoo species, a nomada bee, um, almost hairless. You, you'd be forgiven for thinking this was a wasp of some kind. So many, many different um, shapes and forms and colors. And mm. They vary enormously in size as well. So I'm gonna go global again now. So I, I hope it depends on where you've got your screen um, lined up. I hope you can see that there are three bees on this slide. The one on the left is the largest bee um, in the world and it's Megakali Pluto. And it's a type of leaf cutter. Um, you find it in Indonesia. Um, the bee in the middle is one of our average bumblebee. So this is the sort of, just, just to give you um, perspective, this is the sort of size of a, um, a, a worker bee that you might see in your garden, worker bumblebee. And the bee on the right, the tiniest bee in the world, um, uh, Perdita minima, and, and it's just two millimeters in length, absolutely tiny. So huge, huge diversity um, and range of sizes as well. And so I'm now going to, I, I hope this will work as a video. I have three short videos to show during the, the slideshow and I, they will jump around a bit, but I'm just going to play this one. This is the smallest of our um, bees in Britain and Ireland. This is the harebell bee. Uh, and if you know how small a harebell is, you can appreciate how tiny, not much bigger than a grain of rice. Um, so that's the smallest bee you're likely to see um, here. Now, solitary bees, with there being so many, you can imagine uh, that there are um, almost as many um, nesting requirements, different diverse um, ways of nesting as there are bees themselves. And so I want to just show you a few. Um, so, so that the solitary bees can be broadly divided between those that nest in cavities above the ground, the aerial nesters, and those that nest in the ground, that the ground nesting or mining bees. So, so these are um, some of the sort of places that the um, cavity nesters will nest in. And they're basically, these bees nest in pre-existing cavities or holes. So this is uh, a bunch of bamboos in a bee hotel. This is a red mason bee. Um, and these bees have to collect materials to, to block off each cell. Um, so the red mason collects um, mud, good old fashioned mud. And the way <clears throat> how quickly that their life cycle works, this is a, an orange vented mason bee, is so this is inside um, a tube with a, a really, really clever um, piece of wood that you take off the side and you can see what's happening through the perspex. So this bee will um, come to the back of her, her tube and just make a little bit of a wall, uh, a little bit of a barrier with, a barrier with, with, <coughs> with mud or chewed up leaves or resin or whatever. Then she brings back a lot of pollen and she, she provisions this cell with a large amount of pollen onto which she lays an egg. And then she repeats the process. So, um, so a, a, a wall made out of some kind of um, substance she's brought back, pollen, egg, um, wall, pollen, egg, and so on and so forth until she blocks off the, the, the entrance to the tube. And what happens then is the, the eggs will hatch and the larvae will feed on the pollen. Um, and they'll feed, they'll munch, they'll go through various instars, um, grow, grow, grow. And after a few weeks, they, they wrap themselves in, in a, um, a cocoon and pupate. And once they have developed a few weeks later into adult bees, they then stay there. They stay inside the tube or inside it might be a wall or inside a piece of old rotten wood. And they stay there um, as um, fully developed adults all the way through 
till the same kind of time the following year. And the, the females, um, the females are only actually on the wing for about six weeks. Um, you know, they lay as many eggs as they can during that time and then they die. Um, and, and the males are, are again, only on the wing for a short period of time. And um, as with all other bees, they, they don't play any part whatsoever in the rearing of the brood. So those are the cavity nesting solitary bees. Ground nesting solitary bees, <clears throat> um, you bound to have seen something like this in your travels. This, this, this is telltale sign of um, a ground nesting solitary bee, or it could be a solitary wasp as well, but um, they, they like to nest in, in sparsely vegetated areas in compacted earth um, like this. Um, and and they, they dig tunnels down into the ground. And th these are just the nest architectures, just extraordinary. I mean, th these are just a few, um, a, a few different bees. And I don't think any of these are native to, to Britain and Ireland, but anyway, so, so that's, that's the, that, that, that's the, 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 the solitary bees, that's the solitary bees. And there's one other before, uh, um, I don't know, a couple others actually, I just want to show you another video. Um, because it, I, I've mentioned that the social bees live in colonies um, of hundreds or thousands. Now, solitary bees, although they don't nest in the same nests together, they do often nest alongside each other in enormous aggregations. So this is an aggregation of ivy bees. And it looks like a swarm, but it's not. This is, if you see behavior like this, this is almost definitely, this is the males. Um, they kind of look like they're swarming. They've emerged, they emerged before the females, sort of buzzing around like that, waiting for the females to emerge so they can mate with them. So not to be confused with a colony of bees. And then there are in Britain and Ireland, um, three very special uh, solitary bees that make their nests in abandoned snail shells. And this, this is one of them. Um, this is the gold fringed mason bee, Osmia orulenta. And uh, you can see she's, she's got a little bit of something green in her mouth. And what this bee does um, is after she's laid her, her egg, usually just one or two eggs in the snail shell and filled it in with lots of debris or little bits of sand or, or, or pebbles, she collects, she goes and she, 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 she collects little bits of leaf um, and she comes back and she chews them and then spits them out onto the shells. So it's a little bit like pesto. Um, and then this is, oh, this is a beautiful picture. This is the following year. This is, this is a bee, um, this is a male emerging from that snail shell nest. So those are the snail shell nesters. So look out for those on your land. And then one other solitary bee that I want to tell you a little bit more about, about a, a little in detail, um, is another of my favorites. And this is the wool carder bee. Um, so the wool carder bee, very distinct, that there's nothing else quite like the wool carder that with these kind of, this, it's almost as if he's been painted with battle paint. And, and if you saw him um, in your garden, you, you'd see he is a warrior. He's a gladiator of, of bees. You see these little spikes he has on the bottom of his, his abdomen. They, they, he uses those to go into battle to, 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 um, to chase other bees, male bees of his kind, of his patch. Um, and he's, he's, he will also chase a bumblebee, a, a queen bumblebee, three, four times his size off his patch. And by his patch, because this is a very territorial bee, um, I mean something like lamb's ear. Um, or, or, or any other stachys, anything in the mint family actually. But this is a particularly important resource for the female wool carders because um, the lamb's ear has um, the, these beautiful tiny little hairs, fine hairs on the leaves. Um, and it, what happens when the female flies in? So the females also collect pollen and nectar from this plant. Um, but, but what they really come for is the hairs, the soft downy hairs, and they gather them, they sort of pile them up into a little ball and then fly back to their nest um, in the same way as a mason bee might take mud back or a resin bee might take resin back. The wool carder is taking the, the wool back. Then what she does with the wool when she gets back to the nest is, is even more extraordinary. She, 
So she teases these hairs apart, these until she has the individual hairs, and then she weaves them together um, into a, a, a little a wallet. Um, and, and inside the wallet, so then she does the same as the uh, all the other cavity nests. She provisions uh, this with with pollen, and lays an egg, and then closes it up. And um, so, that, so her her um, the the, la the the larvae, the eggs when they hatch into larvae, hatch out into this beautiful soft downy um, nest. And the the reason that so this is um, these photographs were kindly lent to me by a friend, Vivian Russell, who is a photographer, but she also knows her bees. Thank goodness. Otherwise, she wouldn't have had a clue what it was nesting between her two slide boxes in her studio a few years ago. So this is where she found these little wool carder um, bee cells. And just so it, it's not just 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 lambs here. You know, if, if you are in a, in a wilder habit habitat, um, these bees um, would go for um, all the wound warts. Um, so so. So, yes, yeah, so look out for them, not just in gardens, but also along verges and, and um, woodland edges. Um, oh, so many other bees I'd like to tell you about that, that you just imagine, you know, with that many bees in the world, why people um, are so excited um, by, by their behavior. But moving on, why do insects visit flowers? And of course they visit for, for nectar and pollen. Um, the nectar provides the sugars and the carbs to give them the energy they need. Um, and the pollen, the protein, which they collect uh, really just to take back to feed the young or to provide for the young. This is something um, that's that's um, peculiar to bees. So the other insect visitors don't take pollen back to provide for their young. The other thing that, that insects um, visit flowers for is for the warmth that the flower provides. Um, it's that they do they are they are warmer on a cold day than um a a pavement um or the top of a wall um and they also go to collect prey to search for prey so so with the many of the solitary wasps and and other um carnivores um who feed their young with with prey live or dead so they come and collect the prey from the um from the plants and there are one or two bees um, who also come to the flowering plants to collect oils, floral oils. Um, I should have just, I should have mentioned actually, I'm just going to whiz back to the wool carder bee for a moment because what the wool carder bee um, does, the female, once she has sealed um, this little wallet, is she collects floral oils um, from, from plants, uh, not from lamb's ears, plants like snapdragons and then she infuses this this sort of wool with the oils and it's thought that that might possibly deter parasites um, from these these cocoons but the other bee that that uh, is very well known for collecting oils another of my favorites is the yellow loosestrife bee and the yellow loosestrife bee um so this is this is a bee actually a solitary bee who in britain and ireland collects all of her pollen only from one plant, just from the yellow loosestrife. That's that's so she really is a specialist. That's quite rare, and she also collects oils. And she is a bee who likes to make her nest. She's a ground sort of nesting bee. She she um, she uses areas boggy and damp areas. Um, so in the fens, you, you probably would have a lot of of a, a good population of this bee. But of course it floods and gets damp there. So what she uses the oils for is she lines each cell before she puts the pollen in it with the floral oils to help protect it um, uh, against the, the damp. And there's another thing that is unique about this bee. If you look, she looks very odd, doesn't she? So she's got her, her, her legs stuck up in, in the air. Um, she's obviously been collected pollen as well elsewhere. The reason she has her legs in the air, and to my knowledge, this is this is the only bee, certainly in Britain and Ireland, that does this, is she is indicating to passing males that she is not interested. Um, so she's already mated. So that's another unique trait of this amazing bee. So 
once um, the bees have sort of, um, you know, they, they, they go to these flowers, they have to learn, they have to know how to access um, the nectar and the pollen. And over the millennia, the, these incredible relationships have built up between um, uh, sort of flowering plants and their insect um, visitors and pollinators. And I just want to whiz through a few of, of the different types, the different structures of plants, because this is another important thing. If you, if you know that, that it's not a case of one flower fits all, or one bee pollinates all. We, we need diversity of both. We need to increase diversity of um, floral resources to, to keep and increase um, uh, diversity of, of bees and other pollinators. So this is, this is a really basic plant. This is bindweed. And you can see those are the nectaries at the back. Um, and this bumblebee is going to pass. This is a, um, a common carder bumblebee. Um, and she's going to pass directly underneath to go to these nectaries. And you can see, you can see here that the pollen is going to be brushed onto her, her, her hairy abdomen and back. And then she will take that to, to the next plant. Um, so that's a really open, um, obvious relationship. Um, another type of flower, um, a shaped flower, the, the, the umbellifers and the asters, all sort of flat topped. Uh, so really easy for for insects to land on. And the importance with these plants is that they are suitable for short tongued um, insects. So short tongued bees and, and short tongued hoverflies. Hoverflies mostly have very short tongues. And just, just to, to say that the tongue lengths um, in um, bees in Britain and Ireland vary from between 0.5 of a millimeter all the way up to 15 millimeters. Um, so, so it's not just the shape and size of a bee um, that you need to be catering for, but you need to be catering for bees with different length tongues. So very important that we include plenty of umbellifers and, um, and uh, flowers from the asters um, family in your planting schemes. Then you have plants like dandelions, um, which if you're not already friends with, I would urge you to make friends with your dandelions because they are, um, superfood for bees and so easy. So this is another common carder bumblebee. And the wonderful thing about a plant like a dandelion is that it's it's an inflorescent. It has many, many different florets um, on the top. So this is not just one flower, project, you know, this bumblebee can land on the dandelion and then without using any energy, just walk across the top of the dandelion and collect a lot of nectar and a lot of pollen. So, um, so dandelions and other similar shaped plants. Um, then you have the cup shaped plants. And this is a hairy footed flower bee. Um, another, this is a, again, this is gonna be one of the first bees you'll see in spring. And this is again, a solitary bee. She looks like a bumblebee, but the female looks and sounds and buzzes around like a bumblebee, um, all black. She has a very long tongue. You can see because the nectaries are right down here. So this is a cup shaped plant and the male of the species i just um sticking this in here so you can see why this species is um commonly known as a hairy footed flower bee or to be hairy legged flower bee actually and again a primrose deep deep corolla there so the nectaries right down there um and again like a dish shaped flower to to, to land on Foxglove is interesting. Foxglove's very interesting. So this is this is um, Bombus hortorum, the garden bumblebee, and this is the bee um, with the longest tongue um, in Britain and Ireland. So so fifteen millimeters in length, as long as the bee itself, really. Uh, and you you always I, I know these bees when I see them um, because their tongues are always still hanging out as they go from plant to plant. They tend not to sort of pull them back in again. And the thing about foxgloves is that this is a huge open cavity. Now, the, to, to explain this, I'm gonna show you a diagram uh, of the inside of a foxglove. So if you see here, the reproductive parts of the, of, of the flower are right up against the top of the petal. Now, if you were one of those small harebell bees that, that I showed you earlier on, um, coming to collect nectar from this flower, you would completely avoid um, having any pollen um, deposited on you. So that's, that's not what the flower wants. So 
So the foxglove, and I think this is the beginnings of plant intelligence to me, or certainly adaptations, but I like to think of it as intelligence. Um, you see these little bristly stiff hairs at the edge. They put off um, most of the smaller bees. Um, so you're only ever likely to see large bumblebees coming in and out of the foxgloves in your garden. Of course, there are exceptions. There are bees that climb up the side, but so that's the foxglove. Uh, this is sage, this is, uh, it could be any salvia, and this again is, is very clever because it, you see here, so the plant is like this, like so, when the bumblebee, again this is Bombus hortorum, when she lands on the lower petal, a trigger, um, there's a, a trigger is, is released, um, which plops the, um, the pollen down again on her thorax and her abdomen so that she's covered in pollen and takes it to the next flower. And then I really hope you can see this i hope this is not too jumpy i apologize if it is but this is i wanted just to show you how um how clever these bees are these tiny little creatures um that, that they can work out a that this is where they they get the pollen from and b how to extract it so this is a tiny little mining bee um extracting pollen from a tree lupin She's exposing it here. See it on the spike? And then gathering it. So very, very clever. Red campion, red campion. Obviously this is far too tight an entrance for a bee to walk in and collect pollen. So this is going to take a bee with a long tongue um, or a butterfly and you know, another insect with a long tongue. Um, but, but bees, um, some of our larger bumblebees have worked out a way how to get around this. And what they do is they just bite a hole directly into the nectaries. Um, and this is known as larceny. This is a crime. Um, or nectar robbing. And once this hole has been made, usually by a buff tail or white tail bumblebee, then, you know, all the bees and the wasps, they, they all pile in and, um, and they're, they're secondary robbers. They nick the nectar. Um, if you have beans, um, runner beans, you'll, you'll notice that this happens a lot with your runner beans and plants like aquilegia as well, anything with a long spur too. And I've got caught a bee. Um, I was in Dungeness a few years back. Um, this is Nottingham catchfly and actually caught a bee in the act. You can see her piercing um, straight here into the nectaries, bypassing the whole process of pollination. Um, one other thing I wanted, I mentioned um, earlier that, that there are bumblebees have skills that um, other bees don't have other than a few, uh, in this particular case, a few, few solitary bees, but this is a tomato flower, you'll recognize this. Now, the tomato flower, flowers tight shut, um, they don't produce nectar, only pollen. And honeybees would not have a clue what to do about um, extracting the pollen, and neither would most of our solitary bees. Bumblebees know exactly um, how to get the pollen out. And what they do is the bumblebee flies in and she wraps herself around the plant, the, the flower, and then she disconnects the flight muscles inside her thorax, and starts to vibrate them, but without flapping her wings. And she vibrates and vibrates until her whole body is vibrating. And that is when the flower opens and, and explodes the pollen down onto the abdomen of the bumblebee underneath. That is how your tomatoes get cross pollinated, open pollinated, which of course a tomato can self pollinate, but um, you know, plants like tomatoes, blueberries rely 100% on this technique. Um, you know, if, if I were to give you, um, a self-pollinated tomato, it would not be as sweet and as red and as juicy and as big with as long a shelf life as a cross-pollinated and insect-pollinated tomato or strawberry or blueberry. And again, I have, this is the last video I have. So, so this, um, that's called sonication, by the way, or buzz pollination. Um, and if this works, you will be able to hear why. So this 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 is a poppy, and, and and if you're just sitting in the summer in your back garden and, and listening to bumblebees with their sort of beautiful low sort of deep buzz, and then you suddenly hear a sound like a dentist drill, you will know to look more closely, and hopefully this will work. Um, okay.
So hopefully you were able to, excuse me, <clears throat> hear the difference there between the sound of the high pitched um, sort of buzz foraging compared to when the bumblebee sort of engaged its wings again and flew off. And if you want to know so many more, obviously relationships with 352,000 um, flowering plants and, and 300,000 different pollinating animals, there are many, many more relationships. Um, and if you're interested in that, I cannot recommend this book highly enough. Pollinators and Pollination by Jeff Ollerton. Um, it's very scientific. I, I'm sort of, I'm not a scientist. I don't have a science um, background, uh, but I find it fascinating and uh, I'm learning so much from it. You can follow Jeff on Twitter um, and this is his website. So um, I think this, this remains, this is recorded and online so you can check that out again later. Anyway, <clears throat> once the bees have learned how to collect the, the nectar and the pollen, the next thing they have to do is carry it home. And again, this the way they do this depends on whether they are social or solitary bees. So if you remember social bees, honeybees, you know, this, this is this is this is a picture you'll you'll have seen again and again, you know, a honeybee with great big um pollen baskets of, of pollen on the side leg and a bumblebee as well. Um, huge great big pollen basket. So a bumblebee can carry up to uh, or over 50% of its body weight in pollen back to the nest. Um, and But the thing about the, the honeybees and the bumblebees is that the pollen they have squeezed into their pollen baskets or the corbiculae, um, it is, you, you can see it's really smooth, it's tightly packed, it's not going to fall off. Um, if it did fall off, it would not be viable anyway. So with the social bees, with the bumblebees and the honeybees, it's the pollen that they gather on their abdomens and thorax um, in, on their hairy bodies that is so great for pollination, not the pollen that they collect in their pollen baskets. Now the solitary bees, which um, if you remember are broadly divided between those that um, nest in the ground and those that nest in cavities, they, depending on whether they are ground nesting or cavity nesting, they carry their pollen back to their nests in different ways. So ground nesting bees, um, I'm generalizing here, but, but the majority of ground nesting bees have these, their legs are covered in these stiff branched hairs that are known as scopa, which I think is Italian for broom. And so when this bee collects, and there's some on the side of her body as well, and on this leg, when she collects her pollen, it looks more like this. This is a different ground nest, not, not the same bee, but look, it's all cakey. So there's a lot of um, loose, dusty pollen all the way along the side of her leg and the side of her abdomen. So clearly she's going to lose a lot of that as she goes from plant to plant, um, which makes her an incredibly effective pollinator. And then the cavity nesting bees, so bees like um, the, the mason bees and the leaf cutter bees, um, and this is a leaf cutter. Um, this is a leaf cutter visiting ragwort and just look at the underneath of her abdomen. So these cavity, cavity nesting bees have the same sort of stiff branch scopal hairs, but they're underneath their abdomens. And the, I mean, this is extraordinary. The amount of, um, of, of pollen, that's the dust that's going to drop off as she goes from plant to plant um, is considerable before she gets back to the nest, which is why, uh, you know, the, these are like the unsung pollinators um, of, of the, the world of, of bees. And this, this could just easily be a, a red mason. They look, look very similar. And red mason bees are on the wing at the same time as our apple orchards are in bloom. Um, and they're very important pollinators of apple orchards. And just one red mason bee is capable of doing about um, the same amount of um, pollinating in a day as 100 honeybees. honeybees just because she's messy. So these are the four different ways. There's, there's the social bees carrying back in pollen baskets, cavity nesting under the abdomen and ground nesting um, on the legs and sides of the body. And just one more thing about pollen um, quickly is to say that it's not all yellow and orange. It comes in as many different colors as there are shades in a Dulux chart. And this is this is this beautiful purple. This is Phacelia, so luminescent purple. So so yeah, look out for different colored pollens on bees as well. So um, bee decline, um, the, the reason I do what I do, the reason I speak 
um, about bees is because they are in decline. You know, we, we, we know they are. Um, and if only the causes were simple, but but they're not, you know, that they're, they're, they're complex um, and there are many of them. So I'm not going to go into any great detail today especially with these bottom three. So poor management and husbandry, you'd think would just apply to honeybees, um, but bumblebees are also um, bred now for pollinating. So it applies to bumblebees as well, and um, some solitary bees too. Pollution, light, chemical, electronic, um, non-native species and diseases, uh, often uh, diseases brought in um, when bumblebees and honeybees are imported from, from other countries and, and um, in, in those countries, maybe they've been able to cope with the, uh, the, the, the parasites and the diseases, but they can't in this country. The big ones, the three big ones, climate change, pesticides and fertilizers and habitat loss and fragmentation. So climate change, climate change is huge and not just for obvious reasons, not just because um, of, of floods and droughts, you know, Clearly, if there were there were floods, bumblebee nests um, would be bumblebees would be drowned in their nests. Um, when there is drought, the the plants to survive pull back um, on the nectar, um, so there's not enough food to keep the bees um, going. And most solitary bees don't come out in inclement weather, so so you know weeks and weeks of of awful weather um, is enough to starve the solitary bees. Pesticides and fertilizers. So by pesticides, I mean the full gamut of pesticides, so um, insecticides, herbicides, fungicides. Um, fungicides, very interesting, actually. It, pe people have, th there's been so much focus, rightly, on, on um, in, in particular in recent years, um, the neonicotinoid neonic group of pesticides, insecticides. Um, but th together, when they are, um, uh, th they all of these different pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, they create a toxic cocktail, but the fungicides um, could, um, and I've only, this has only been on my radar recently, I've only read a few, um, a few papers about this. The honeybees, when they bring pollen back to their hives, they don't feed that pollen as it is directly to the larvae. Um, they, a little bit like they turn nectar into honey, they turn pollen into bee bread. And to do that, they, they use some gut enzymes um, and um, they, they use um, sort of wild yeasts that, that um, are, are in, in the, the hive. And if they are bringing back pollen with lots of fungicide on it, then that could kill the wild yeasts off and interfere with the process um, of making the bee bread that feeds the larvae. Um, so it's a lot more complicated than it first seems. Fertilizers, uh, again, so it's not the fertilizer itself that kills the bee, it's what the fertilizers do. The fact that in, in land that is drenched with fertilizers, it's wiping out so many of the native wildflowers or so-called weeds and um, you know, encouraging growth of vigorous ryegrasses and so on and so forth. So it's, it's reducing forage for, for um, insect pollinators and habitat loss and fragmentation. Um, we, we've lost 98% of our wildflower meadows and grasslands since the end of the um, Second World War. And what's left is, is fragmented. Um, it, 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 so, so you've got diminishing populations of, of bees or other insects on what is left. And if they can't get to each other, if there are no sort of um, uh, wildlife corridors or rivers of flowers, then then that's a problem. Um, you know, we're going to lose genetic diversity. Um, and as I said earlier, habitat loss. There are some bees, um, that, that the generalists, that are coping relatively well. But the specialist bees, the bees that relied uh, on on most of our um, declining wildflowers from these these flower rich meadows, are the ones that are really suffering. And this is kind of this sums it all up. You know, um, the, this is probably drenched. Um, these fields, these green fields, green deserts, um, and that's oilseed rape at the back there, which is great for a short while for the honeybees that can be taken there, and any bumblebees that um, have survived, have built nests in these edges and can forage, but then there's nothing else for the rest of the year, and going back to the life cycle, bees need foraging um, for, for the, for the, to sustain the entire life cycle. Um, so, 
But the good news is that there is an awful lot that we can do to help. Uh, there, there are some issues that, that you know, I, I despair sometimes. I think, what can I do other than sign petitions for this, that and the other issue? But with bees, we can all do something. Um, first of all, reduce pesticide use. Uh, you know, th think about the damage it's doing and, and wean yourselves off. It, it's not easy, I know, even speaking, I, I'm just a, a gardener. I, I, I don't have any experience um with, with farming or or large-scale land use and i know just just inheriting a garden 10 years back um that had been doused with all sorts of um, um herbicides and insecticides took me a few years without having anything um putting anything on it before a balance was achieved but a balance is always achieved in the end you know it brings in all the beneficial insects so on and so forth forage um so the nectar and pollen the importance here i hope you will have seen from all of those different shaped plants flowering plants i showed you earlier along is diversity of flowering plants and continuity we need to be providing um flowers from early spring to to late autumn and beyond now with climate change um the other thing i didn't tell you about climate change of course is it's not just the floods and the drought but um the, the, the insects are out of sync with their flowering plants. So, so flowering plants are um, coming out later or earlier than the, the insects, so they're missing them. Um, so continuity and also um, through the winter as well. We, we need to have plants through for the winter and an abundance. And it's better to plant whatever you're planting, plant it in clumps or large areas, rather than having flowers, sort of a few flowers spread out over a large area. It's better to have a lot of flowers in a small area. Increase wild areas. This is this is for habitat. So the bees' needs are forage um, and shelter. You know, something to eat and somewhere to shelter. And if you increase the wild areas, you will um, increase potential habitat for um, for solitary and um, bumblebees to to nest. And mow less. But I put a little asterisk here because our ground nesting solitary bees um, would not fare well if we all left all of our grass to grow into meadows. Because of course they like uh, sort of compacted soil and shorter grass and um, sort of sparsely vegetated areas. So so leave some for them. Join community pollinator initiatives. Together we are greater than the sum of our parts. Um, you know, be a honeybee. Um, everything they do is for the greater good. So so we could learn a lot from them. And then support join um, uh, and support organisations like Bug Life, um, the Bumblebee Conservation Trust and the Pesticides Action Network, all really important um, charities, all boxing above their weight. Um, so now, uh, just, just to, the, the, the last um, few slides I want to show you um, are also just, just, this is all about habitat now. And these here, um, th these four photographs are all of different sorts of meadows. And the top left is uh, a perennial wildflower um, meadow. That's this is at Martin Down, uh, just outside Salisbury, and and this is the sort of meadow that we've lost. We've we've lost these, the, the, and with it, the abundance of insects that used to rely on them. And then here, this is this is you know it's just buttercups and daisies. Uh, but but again, fantastic. So many different insects um, feeding in and amongst these flowering plants. And then here, oxide daisies, again, um, mostly oxide daisies and, and many, many different grasses. So, so when, yeah, don't forget the grasses as well and, and the, the, the native, other native plants that not necessarily the flowering plants um, for different stages of the life cycles of butterflies and moths and other insects. So we're not just thinking flowers, um, we're thinking wild plants, sort of um, nettles and grasses. And here, uh, I just wanted to show you this one because I, this has both red and white clover in it. And the thing, red and white clover, red clover has um, is a deeper corolla, so it's it's great for long-tongued bumblebees, and the white clover a little bit shorter. And then, as I mentioned, because of fragmentation, we need uh, we need wildlife corridors. Um, this is what a verge should look like: um, at verges, wildlife corridors, rivers of flowers. Um, bee lines, um, call them what you will, we need more of them. And obviously verges are one way, 
to, to um, attain this. And then the other huge way is hedges. Uh, and and this is oh, this is a magnificent um, hedge. So this is may blossom hawthorn, which is just brilliant. But but you know when, when you're planting a native hedge, you add add many many other flowering um, plants. So so hawthorn, blackthorn, crab apple, wild cherries. Stick them all in, um, and. And, and yeah, if you are, um, if, if you have to, if it's on the edge of a road and you have to, of course you do cut it, um, maybe leave the, leave the inside on the inside of the field to grow like this. You know, there's, there's no danger here. Um, just fantastic. And underneath here as well, brilliant, all of these areas for, for nesting bumblebees. And other shrubs. So, so just to mention a few important shrubs for diversity. Um, so pussy willow so important at the beginning of the the queen bumblebees um, life cycle when they emerge from hibernation brambles brambles support an enormous diversity uh, next time you you, you so the, the brambles are flowering you know just just go and watch and and just see if you can count the countless different insects visit bramble honeysuckle or any other climbers um, always great and ivy ivy is at the end of the year what the pussy willow is, is at the beginning of the year. You can hear ivy before you see it um, when it's flowering, when it's in flower. Um, and trees, apple trees, fruit trees, um, fruit trees, plum trees, apple trees, pears, um, crab apples. Again, um, you know, and, and if you if you are planting an orchard or have space for more than one, try to make um, to, to choose varieties that that flower in succession. Um, so it's not just a all flowering now and and nothing next month and then just a few a few of my favorites and i've, I've chosen these um I, I haven't i'm not focusing on on um non-natives at all and garden plants today but you know we have a very small garden um and we we have a lot of um plants that are non-native but we we bulk it out with the native wildflowers so the trefoils um, absolutely brilliant. White dead nettle. If you have white dead nettle, you will get common card of bumblebees. They love it. Um, self heal again, really, really good for sort of areas where you want to, to, to keep cutting and have it come back. It's very resilient. And uh, red campion. This is a, um, a, a verge, um, a, a roadside um, in our village, which is just magnificent. And oh, the plant on the left is possibly my favorite plant. Um, for, for, for bees and it's vipers bugloss. Um, it's an echium and the thing about vipers bugloss, uh, it's a biennial and when it's in flower, when it's flowering, it's open. Uh, it's producing pollen and nectar the whole time it's in flower. That's not necessarily the case with, with other plants. Some only produce nectar for a few hours in the morning or a few hours in the afternoon or, um, but, but vipers bugloss, if it's flowering, it's producing and then scabias and um, knapweeds again they're beautiful plants to bring into your your garden and then just a few just chosen a few individual plants to finish up with to show you how how if you if you plant the right plants or allow um that certain plants to just be you know the volunteers um like the dandelions huge diversity um of of insect visitors so that's dandelion is one um, yarrow is another. I had no idea until uh, we lived in Dorset until we moved to Cornwall and um, our lawn was covered. We, we thought, okay, we'll leave it and see what comes up before we um, plant, fill it full of wildflower plugs and yellow rattle and yarrow came up everywhere and I thought, ah, I'm not sure about yarrow. Never seen so much um, insect diversity as I did that year on the flowering yarrow. Um, and not everyone's friend, but thistles, creeping thistles, if, if they're on your land, um, silver lining is um, that they will produce just the most amazing nectar and pollen for numerous different um, pollinating insects. So just a couple of other things. If you, I, I don't know who's here. I don't know um, if the audience today is made mostly made up mostly of farmers, um, but but I just wanted for those of you like me who are not um, farmers and don't have land, this is a lawn meadow. You know, if you have a little lawn, you can just leave the vetches and clovers and self heels to grow. Just just don't mow as much, and you'll have a little mini meadow in your back garden. And if you don't even have a garden, but you have a doorstep, 
you can plant a mini meadow um, in a tub or an old bath. And we planted this up in our last house um, and it just kept on flowering. It was just fantastic. And we had we had a couple of um, two different um, ground nesting solitary wasps as well, bringing their prey and making their nests beneath the soil. So, um, yeah, whoever you are, whatever your resources, there is something you can do to help bees and other pollinators. And just a few resources now um, to finish up with. Um, for those of you who, who, who do have access, who, who either farm or have um, our landowners, I cannot recommend highly enough the resources on the All Ireland Pollinator Plan website. They are superb. Um, so I just want to mention them. And also the Bumblebee Conservation Trust who work and have been working for many years with farmers. So, so really great resources there. And then um, just here, um, a couple of books. If you're interested in the bees themselves, you need to get Stephen Falk's Field Guide to Bees of Great Britain and Ireland. If you want to know which plants to grow, uh, and this is not just non, um, not just the natives, but the non-natives as well, Plants for Bees um, is just the best book out there. It's written by people who know their plants and their bees. Um, two more books, brilliant books. Um, Rebugging the Planet by Vicky Hurd, um, who I think is speaking about rebugging the planet tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock um, with Sally Ann Spence and Gillian Burke. So that's a session to sign up to if you haven't already. And Silent Earth by Dave Goulson um, or any book by Dave Goulson, um, absolutely brilliant. And just to finish off, I hope you won't mind a little plug for my book, uh, Dancing with Bees, A Journey Back to Nature, which contains pretty much everything I've talked about in this talk and a lot more besides. It's not a reference book, um, it's a narrative, um, but, uh, and also it'd be lovely, here's, the, here's me on Twitter, at Beastlebridge, and that is my blog spot um, where you could buy my book, actually. I can do signed copy with a nice um, bookmark in it. So I'm going to finish now uh, and I'm going to unshare my screen so I can take any questions. And thank you for listening. Bravo, Bridget. Yes, there we go. You've done a very rare thing, Bridget, which is that during your talk, your numbers, the uh, audience has grown and grown and grown. And believe me, on all the hundreds of Zoom talks that I've been part of in the last year, a couple of years, that's a very rare thing indeed. So your bees and you have enchanted people, as of course we knew that they would. Um, may I just um, back up what Bridget was saying that I thoroughly recommend buying her book, which is a story of her personal journey of discovering bees and what Bridget has done for bees and what you yourselves can do for bees and the joy of learning about them and also do follow Bridget on Twitter for um, links to art and links to books and links to conservation projects and all sorts of wonderful things. Bridget we've had some questions come in which I'll put to you now. Um, first one comes from um, Colin Trier who keeps honeybees. He says, my experience of keeping honeybees in a rewilding project is that by early and uh, abundant pollinating of species like dandelion, they encourage them to flower more. And in my view, provide a resource for other pollinators. However, it's generally considered that honeybees are a threat to pollinator diversity through competition for pollen resources in ecologically rich situations. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, that's very interesting. I had not thought um, of them being, uh, of course, when they, they fly en masse as pollinators, of course, they're going to pollinate a lot of flowers that might otherwise not have been pollinated. But yes, they, they, they are competition, um, especially in areas um, where there are declining numbers of bees with similar length tongues. So, so there are some flowers, you know, having, having listened to all of that, you'll know that um, that, that there are plenty of bumblebees that will be able to feed off um, from resources that the honeybees don't go anywhere near. But I think it's a big problem that certainly bub honeybees are not endangered. You know, they're, they're not on any red lists. Um, so people who are keeping honeybees because they think they're going to help bees 
are on the wrong track. Like you will not help bees by keeping honeybees. Um, I think I think if for hobby beekeepers, um, you know, the odd hive is fine. You know, the, if if you don't have hives, honeybees will go feral and they will find um, places to 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 build colonies anyway. But there is research out that that says that they definitely definitely um, outcompete um, and cause. Um, but especially with bumblebees, they cause bumblebee nests to be smaller and bumblebee um, offspring to be smaller in size. So, but yeah, I hadn't thought about the, the opening part of that question about them also pollinating more flowers, but, um, but yeah, be careful. And if you, if you do keep bees, plant more flowers for them as you would if you kept any other form of um, wild animal, you know, you would, you would bring in um, resources for it. Do the same with honeybees. People are not here to, to hear me, Bridget, but I, I wondered whether also um, bee, honeybees, and I'm not implying in any way that, you're, um, that Colin is, is, is himself doing this, but um, honeybees are sometimes used as camouflage by the media um, when communicating about bees, when it is our solitary bees and their habitats and the flowers they depend on and the corridors of landscape through the landscape that they need, which is actually what's important. I, 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 one of the veins of my life is, is that, I, you know, go back to the opening slides, when I um, say I talk about bees, people say, oh, I know a beekeeper. And I, I can't believe that we are still having to say, so 10, 15, 20 years on, that there are other bees too. You know, there are, there are 20,000 other bees. Um, and, and that, and it's also a lot of organisations tick. I think what you're saying there, they tick the boxes by putting um, hives on their roofs. Um, not a good idea. Even less so in cities, in urban environments, it's a disaster because there is not enough forage to go around in urban environments for for the native bees and um, the many, many more honeybees. Thank you very much, Bridget. We now have a question from Claire Lyons, who's a student of organic horticulture. Um, are there issues with the wildflower seed mixes being sold? Yes, in some cases, um, because some of them, it depends on the provenance. If you want to be um, really, really careful about this, what I would do is I would go to a local wildlife trust and ask them if I could, um, if, where, the, where they get their seeds from, basically, so that you've got, you know, in the southwest, I would, I would um, collect and, and plant, especially if you're doing this on a, a landscape basis, not, not in gardens, but if you're a gardener, it doesn't matter. Um, but, but yeah, there are, I think that they're one of the, too many people now just buy wildflower mixers, and they're mostly pictorial meadow mixers, and that's putting a lot of non-natives out into the landscape. Um, and that's no good for the pollinators that have co-evolved with the native wild flowers, um, because then they, they they are they would tend not to go for the non-natives. So, so yeah, be careful with your sources, I think, and speak to your local wildlife trust and ask who they use. Very much so. And again, if I may chip in, sorry, Bridget, um, <laughs> there are particular species, for example, a lot of the very commercial mixes contain a bird's foot trefoil that's been grown because it's high protein, high nitrogen food for cattle as, a as, a, as the plant itself, not for the flower. And that's the one when you see tall, leggy, upright growing plants of um, bird's foot trefoil, it's t genetically bird's foot trefoil, but it is not the, speed, the, the thing that our pollinators have evolved uh, with. And also in many parts of the country, greater knapweed, there are um, a, a European variant of the plant, which belongs in Europe, which is wonderful, has spread widely and is hybridizing with our native form. Yeah. Um, and so you have to be jolly, jolly careful. But there are, for want of a better word, purist um, suppliers, as Bridget was saying. And now we have a question. So I said clover is another one that's a big issue with the, the red clovers. You know, they're, they're fantastic, but but they've been used um, as, as sort of um, ground cover. Um, and yeah, again, like you say, they've been, they, they've had, they, they're not native and natural anymore. They're not what our bees are used to. 
<laughs> they're cultivated forms thereof, which are great for feeding cows and putting protein into cows, but they're not really what the bees are yeah. looking for. Now, um, finally, uh, from the people, do if anyone's um, wishing to, and you've got a question we, uh, that Bridget hasn't covered, please do pop it in and I'll try to get to it. But one from Rebecca Swin. Thank you, Rebecca. Hi, Bridget. What flower species are useful for bees, but also for encouraging predatory insects with the aim of reducing pests in arable farming and eliminating reducing pesticides? use what a fascinating question well that's a big one that and that's a little bit out of my um my experience but my the off the top of my head i would say the umbellifers if you you're wanting to attract hoverflies sort of beneficial insects and um sort of predatory wasps i would go for the the, the plants the the umbellifers and the asters um, so that you've got the plants that will bring those short-tongued insects in, which are also predators, happen to be predatory. So I, I would up those. And those are the ones that often um, don't, they're, they're, not, they're not as newsworthy, they're, they're not as pretty, um, and people tend to, to forget them. But yeah, that's, that would be what I would do. Forgive me, I don't know whether you said it, but umbellifer um, means carrot family, so yeah. anything... Yes anything in the carrot family because they're flat topped and you often, well, lots of your pictures showed um, wasps perching, or oh, several of your pictures showed wasps perching on them. Bridget, just since we've got a few minutes left and we haven't got any other questions, a question from me. If you were suddenly given a hundred acre farm and told Bridget Strawbridge, here is your farm, what in terms of creating the habitats, the micro habitats that bees need and the range of pollinators need, what would you do on your farm to make it an excellent place for bees? The very first thing I would do um, is increase the hedges. Um, I would plant many, many, many um, sort of native hedgerows. Um, I would, oh, I, I'd, I'd, I'd create a mosaic of different habitats, I think. Um, I would read up on my Charles Flower um, wildflower meadow book um, and I'd plant trees, but take care of them, plant the right trees um, for the right climate in the right places. Um, and you know what, I, I think, I would probably bring in livestock. Um, I, I wouldn't have said that a few years ago, but from all I've read recently, I would bring in livestock because I have come to see from, from well, from reading um, James Rebank's book, um, really how important it is for us to get back to the type of landscapes that we will have lost that was so rich and diverse, um, it, you know, with, with flowers and, and insects and wildlife. And I can't see how that can happen without, um, without having livestock on, on the farm. Um, and then I'd go and live there too. And I'd dig loads of ponds. I'd create huge amounts of, of sort of areas um, of, of the ponds. Um, if, if there were any water, I'd bring in beavers. <laughs> oh, now I'm thinking, now, now it's just Christmas. Um. <laughs> I've, I've given you your own desert island, only it's a have, yeah. farm that you can turn into a giant <laughs> garden for bees. Um, well, Bridget, we don't have any more questions. Um, and so uh, is there anything that you want to end with before I wrap things up just a... Um, because I'm aware that at 10.30 we have to finish and the channel is needed for the next session. Yeah, no, the only thing I'd say is, is that I, for me, the most important thing is to get out there and have a look to see what you already have. Um, get to know the insects you, you've already got. You don't need to identify them. You don't need to know them by name. Um, you just watch them, spend time, make time. We, we, we are all sort of too caught up in the merry-go-round to make time to go and and appreciate and be in awe um, of the lives that these insects um, live and ask questions. Start when you're watching something, to, you know, think, I wonder, allow yourself to wonder and ponder um, and try and work out what's going on because, because I think the rest follows. I think once you, uh, you know, we can, we can read lists, we can read, we can tick lists, um, we can buy mixes, like you say, and plant mixes. But if we, if we, if we're doing that 
um, be because we've read somewhere that it's good to do. It's not the same as as knowing why you're doing it, doing it, doing it from from the heart um, because you want to keep the insects and other creatures that are already there and and bring back those that have um, maybe flown over or um, left. So yeah, just that. Thank you, Bridget. I'm just monitoring the chat at the moment and there is a veritable flood of thanks for you oh, um, yeah. and comments about how valuable and how interesting, how fascinating and how inspiring your talk has been. So may I just echo that, Bridget. I've had the privilege of talking to you a number of times and it is always a joy. And no matter how many times I listen to you speaking, I am absolutely wrapped by your passion for the bees, for your love for them, your ability to communicate. Um, complex things so simply and accessibly so on behalf of everybody and as I speak the chat is being flooded with thanks so on behalf of everybody who's here thank you very very much indeed Bridget Strawbridge. Thank Howard. you thank you everybody for listening and thank you for the questions and thank you Nick for stepping in at the last minute. Mwah. Very welcome enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>